What if Monty Python's Flying Circus had been episodic rather than a sketch show? And then, a few years after the series ended, several of their greatest hits were recreated using puppets. Well, that never happened. However, it did happen to the program that was a heavy influence on the Python style. I am, of course, talking about the highly esteemed Goon Show! I looked up my dad's trousers once. <laughs> And I discovered something. What? That's where he keeps his legs. <laughs> you ever seen your daddy's legs? No. He always takes them to work with him. This radio series, which was produced from 1951 to 1960, was a blend of ludicrous plots, surreal humour, witty retorts, catchphrases, and bizarre sound effects. That tricycle against the wall. Whose is it? Mine. A present from an admirer. Could you drive me to town on it? Oh, the tricycle isn't mine. The wall was the present. I'm walking backwards a Christmas. It was created by four friends who were fresh out of the army and trying to break into show business. Spike Milligan, who wrote practically all of the episodes, Peter Sellers, who became known as one of the world's greatest character actors, Harry Seacombe, who is perhaps best remembered for being a fine tenor singer rather than a comedian, and Michael Benteen, who co-wrote the show but left after series three. I've just come into the front room and found him lying on the carpet there. Ah, oh, is he dead? I think so. Oh, hadn't you better make sure? All right, just a minute. He's dead. First broadcast with the title Crazy People, because the BBC did not approve of the word goon, the episodes originally had very little structure, making it much more of a sketch show. Until a few years later when the characters had fully taken shape, and the standard format of an episode would involve the poetically peculiar events surrounding the life of the very silly and very round Neddy Seagoon, and the many mad characters he had to interact with. Through the pigeonhole flew a carrier pigeon. There was something stuffed to his leg. It was a postman. You were a green grocer? No, I'm not green. I was more of a dirty yellow colour. <laughs> Haven't you read the court circular? No, I'm waiting until they make the film. <laughs> the man many praise as being a king within the field of comedy would praise working on The Goon Show as being the highlight of his successful but troubled life. Whereas Spike, who outlived Peter by over 20 years, disliked that it was the most praised thing he ever did. Though this was undoubtedly due to the great emotional stress and pressure Milligan was under, being the main writer of the show, which triggered a mental breakdown in 1953, resulting in the end of his marriage and a lifetime of depression. After Benteen left, Milligan's co-writers were either Larry Stevens, who also co-wrote for the Army Game until his untimely death at the age of 35, and Eric Sykes, who would become almost as big a legend of British comedy as Spike. Are you a spy? Yes! Then why are you covered in mint? I'm a mint spy! I'm Eric <laughs> I discovered this revolutionary program in a fairly roundabout way. The year was 2006. I was 14 and had just watched a Pink Panther film for the first time. A very big coincidence considering that was the same year as the reboot starring Steve Martin. So I bought myself one of the many rehashed DVD box sets of this franchise. One of the bonus features on the bonus features disc was a documentary about the life of Peter Sellers, which naturally mentioned, and gave audio samples, of The Goon Show. How many times have I told you not to drive that leather omnibus round the bedroom in broad daylight? <laughs> you know these blinds are drawn, they're not real. I had you call me my captain. I had my captain call me. Do you mind if I take a gander around the shop? No, as long as it's house trained. Something about those clever jokes and silly voices piqued my interest immediately. <laughs> it's the front door. I didn't know who Spike Milligan was yet, but I of course recognised Harry Seacombe from my favourite musical. Oh, poor man, you must be starving. Here, take that. <laughs> Oh, buddy. That'll teach you not to be poor in front of me again. I mentioned to my mum my sprouting interest in this series, to which she popped up to the attic and returned with a few items belonging to my granddad, who had died when I was three. 
a Peter Sellers biography, The Mask Behind the Mask, and three cassette tapes containing a total of 12 episodes of The Goon Show. What time is it, Echo? Uh, just a minute, I, I got it written down here on a piece of paper. <laughs> Browsing the fan site GoonShow.net, I saw information regarding the visual interpretations of this groundbreaking program. These include a show called Fred, which ran for one month in 1956, and starred Peter Sellers and Graham Stark. It is a primitive version of Spike Milligan's future project, Q. And down among the Z-Men, which is to the Goon Show what Dragon Ball Evolution is to Dragon Ball. Though I'm not sure if having the actors from the quality product being in the vastly inferior one is better or sadder. Made in 1952, its slight hook is that Benteen hadn't turned the quartet into a trio yet, and since the first four years of the radio series are goon forever, the film is a rather feeble example of what Mike added to the show. You're the professor. Yes, I am. Yes, I'm <laughs> well, I shall need my reading glasses for this. Yeah? Ah, the perfect. I don't need glasses. <laughs> Neither do I. The adaptation slash spin-off that grabbed my attention the most was The Telegoons. This show, produced in 1963 and 64, recreated 26 of the highly comedic radio series, using string puppets for wide shots and rod puppets for close-ups. These rather fugly looking puppets could be operated to make the characters blink, flap their mouths, and turn their heads. I came here as a boy. I didn't think you came here as a girl. Oh, I don't know that. You Chinese are very damn clever people. Voiceovers were then provided by Seacom, Sellers, and Milgan, who, just like with the radio series, would occasionally get a little bit carried away. Perhaps this could be blamed on the continuation of their tradition of drinking brandy mixed with milk during the show's recordings. May I come in? Have you committed any crimes? I'm afraid not. And you can't come in. Take your hat off. <coughs> come in. Unlike the TV series, the Telegoon's website is certainly a colourful one, and has been viewable since 1999, though it seems to be abandoned as it hasn't been touched since 2008. At least they left it in safe hands. Trusty cardboard obsessed Blue Bottle is guarding a link to a We Want This Show on DVD petition and standing, or rather hanging above, an inaccurate statement. An unusual boy. In what way? Older than his parents, you know. Mmm. Nasty. Mentioning Spotty Herbert has made me realise that while I've spoken about the cast, I haven't discussed the characters yet. Harry Seacombe played the main character, Neddy Seagoon. While most of the people around him are either idiots or insane, Seagoon is sort of in between those two categories, and is very much a caricature of Seacombe's persona. You really can't see very far, can you? No, I have to wear braille socks. <laughs> <laughs> Although Harry did occasionally voice other characters, especially if it gave him a chance to use his native Welsh accent, he definitely didn't have the range of sounding as unrecognisable as his two co-stars. This rocket will give England a clear lead of a hundred years over Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar? He's been dead 2,000 years. Then that puts us even further ahead of him. <laughs> He'll never catch up with us now. If England means as much to you as England means to me... They don't make idiots like that nowadays. The reoccurring characters Peter Sellers played were Hercules Grip Pipe Thin, the suave-sounding villain with many mad money-making schemes. My firm, the Plastic Nurgler and Thrimble Company of America, are offering that sum to the first man to play the saxophone in concrete boots on top of the highest mountain in the world. How would you like to join my great international Christmas pudding exhibition? The Moriarty horse-drawn Zeppelin service will fly you around the Cape in 80 days, thereby avoiding the traffic at Oxford Circus. Major Dennis Bloodnock, a very cowardly and thoroughly naughty military man, who is also my personal favourite character, what are you doing up that tree? Waiting for a bird. I'd be a just good friend, you understand. It's all lies, I tell him. I'm here to offer you money. Oh, Ned, Ned. Come in and warm yourself by this woman. 
Aren't you an Eddie Seagull and the singing dwarf? Yes, I've just been thrown off a train. Any decent driver would have done the same. If my hands weren't tied, I'd close with you. Your hands are tied, are they? Sure they are. Huh? Bloodlock, take your hands off my wallet. Bloodlock was the only character to have his own theme tune, which played every time he was about to enter a scene. Oh, no more curry eggs for me. <laughs> A recurring gag in the Goon Show is that Bloodnock supposedly has explosive farts. I say supposedly because it is only ever heavily hinted rather than confirmed. Let's have a quick resume. Oh, that's better. <laughs> in the Telegoons, not only is his fanfare absent, but his fantastic farts were changed to the occasional belch. Uh, okay. Good manners, Dennis Manners. Bloodnock! You must stop drinking that sake. Without it, no back pay. Oh, just this one, please. It, it's thirsty work, this drinking, you know. Blue Bottle is a little boy scout with a high-pitched voice, forever announcing his actions, and, according to the audience, was the most popular character in the series. Hello, King. <laughs> Who pulled her trousers up? <laughs> And for those who didn't like the character, they would still be pleased for him to turn up, as his presence meant that sooner or later he would be getting blown up. Here we go again. You and Henry Crun, a very old man seemingly on the verge of disintegration. Did you take your male hormone pills? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh. They give me the strength to go to sleep, me. <laughs> the weather I got. I can't see for all this snow coming down. The mildly miserable Spike Milligan described the characters he played as complete losers who were merely just sidekicks to the part Sellers played. While there is truth in this, that doesn't detract his skill as a voice actor, nor does it make the characters he played any less beloved, particularly Eccles. How far is it to Fort Bowles? Thirteen miles. Fourteen? That's unlucky. Oh, fourteen miles then. See, it was unlucky. I'm a mile further away, no? With a voice Milligan took from Disney's Goofy, Eccles is completely brainless, but his constantly blissfully bemused attitude makes him completely lovable. Come on, off you! What? What? Me off? You know who you're talking to? Who? You heard of the Duke of Norfolk? Yes. Whoa, I'm Eccles. Count Jim Moriarty had the biggest development across the ten series out of all the characters. Zachary Fred, we're being attacked! Up on the wall, men! If you want me, I'll be under the bed! Beginning as a stereotypical French accent, he gradually became something of a mouldy monster and pathetic henchman to Grip Pipe Thin. Did you dampen those matches? Oh, God, I did. I put them in my pocket and I stood in the lake all night. Obviously the blizzard has delayed the train. <laughs> I'm not going to wait any longer. My nerves are strained to breaking point. So are your hairs. <laughs> there goes one now. And Minnie Bannister, a wobbly old woman and Henry Crun's partner in dementia. Oh, did you say where it was? Yes, madam. Oh, I'd better go out and get the washing in. You're not out here. Are you sure? You're right, I'm not. I'm not out there. Help, I'm lost. We'll all be murdered in our bed. The television episodes were trimmed down to 15 minutes, making them 10 minutes shorter than the radio series. Though at least five of those 10 minutes were taken up by singer Ray Ellington and harmonica player Max Geldry. The Telegoons was adapted for a slightly shorter, much more visual format by Maurice Wiltshire who would spend most of his career writing jokes for Dick Emery, and also co-wrote a few episodes of The Goon Show, yet none of these were adapted for this TV series. The show was choreographed by Tony Young, who over ten years earlier had directed another primitive movie the goons had cobbled together. The puppets were all created by Ron Field and Tony Young's father, Ralph, and the characters' designs were all based on sketches drawn by Milligan. With the exception of Moriarty, I feel they represent how I envisioned the characters as looking quite well. The Telegoon's soundtrack was composed by Ed White, 
whose most successful composition, Puffin Billy, was used as the theme tune to the American kids show Captain Kangaroo, and was featured in the first episode of the comic strip Presents. Some viewers assumed that the Telegoons took audio samples from the radio series, rather than having the three comedians re-record their dialogue. But you can tell straight away this wasn't the case by comparing two samples. What are you doing here? A special job, buddy? Yes, and Mr. Thine pays us a goodly sum to mix Futter, the wonder boot exploder, into boot polish that is exported to England. What are you doing here? Um, special job, buddy, buddy. Mr. Sign pays us a goodly sum to mix Futo, the wonder boot exploder, into boot polish. Now, how do you intend tipping Mount Everest on its side? Isn't it obvious? No. Oh. Well, uh, any other suggestions? How do you intend tipping Mount Everest on its side? Well, isn't it obvious? No. Then I have another idea. Tony Young had intended to use the original Goon Show's recordings, thereby saving a hell of a lot of money by avoiding having to pay three of the most popular comics in Britain a performance fee. What about the money? The money! I'll give you an advance. Here's an oil printing of a cheque for £300. Good. Take it to the Royal Academy and cash it, money out the pilot episode, The Lost Colony, which involves Seagoon being tricked into believing he is the rightful owner of New York, was made in 1960 and produced by Wendy Danielli, who co-founded Grosvenor Films with Tony Young. Wendy had appeared in two films directed by Young, but besides these three credits, she appears to have dropped off the showbiz radar. The first episode was broadcast on the 5th of October 1963. Other viewing for that day included the variety show Comedy Bandbox and an episode of The Sentimental Agent. When I was young, I couldn't tell the difference between my mother and father. Oh, you know what my daddy done? What did he done? He done made my mother grow a beard. Oh, that was clever. Can you get tell the difference? No, you see, my father had a beard too. One week later, it was finally The Lost Colony's time to air, but without an updated opening title card, it still held on to its claim of being the real first episode of the Telegoons. That man died without heirs. He died bald? Yes, but only from the waist up. The last episode of Series 1 aired on the 28th of December 1963, and three months later, Series 2 began. Six episodes of Series 1 were repeated in early autumn of 1964, and one year later, five episodes from Series 2 were also re-aired. As for international releases, The Telegoons was broadcast in New Zealand and Australia, where The Goon Show was becoming just as popular as it was in Britain. It was uncertain until the last minute whether Peter Sellers would be available to take part in revoicing the characters he had played weekly for nearly ten years, he was by now a movie star in the UK and USA. In 1963 and 64, he starred in The Wrong Arm of the Law, Heavens Above, The First Two Pink Panthers, and Doctor Strangelove. Therefore, half the episodes of Series 1 were first voiced by an impersonator, then redubbed by Sellers when he eventually arrived at the studio. In a few of the episodes, the sound editor seems to have mixed up the Impressionist and the Impressions of the Impressionist, as those with a keen ear will detect that Bloodnock's voice is at times similar but different. Oh, I'm sorry, I was fishing. Fishing? This is the 34th floor. Oh, the river must have dropped. Incidentally, Sellers' near-fatal heart attack did not deter the broadcasting of the Telegoons, as it happened the day after the second episode of Series 2 aired, and one week later, Episode 3 aired as normal. All 26 episodes naturally contained minor and major alterations to their audio-only counterparts, and a big one is the absence of the fifth goon, Wallace Greenslade. I would like to thank those of you who sent old Greenslade all those lovely gifts of ties, socks, and shirts. Keep sending them in, Greensladers, and here is my new address. Greenslade's Natty Gents Outfitters, Petticoat Lane, London. 
Greenslade was a newsreader at the BBC who took over the act of narrator for The Goon Show after Andrew Timothy quit, around the same time as Michael Benteen. This story opens in the basement of a disused fish squirting factory. <laughs> the announcer acted the part of straight man, though his dialogue was usually just as comedic as the comedians he shared the stage with, and occasionally he played a part in the plot. The green slate was a fake. After we removed the layers of green slate, look what we found underneath. Hello, Captain. The use of a narrator was included into the Telegoons, but the job often went to Griphike Finn. Wallace Greenslade had died aged 48, just over a year after the last episode of The Goon Show was broadcast. Yes, that was it. The last of them, so bye now. Here are three examples of other differences between the two sources. In Napoleon's Piano, while sailing across the English Channel on a piano they stole from the Louvre, the piano and its thieves are blown up because it is mistaken for Rockall. In the Telegoon's version, they manage to sail the piano to Britain, find out it's a forgery, and thus sail it back to France, whereupon they get beaten up by les gendarmes du Paris. Room 502. But that's on the 34th floor! Don't worry, monsieur. Just take the stairs. In Tales of Montmartre, out of jealousy that his girlfriend is in love with Paul Gauguin, Sigun burns down the Eiffel Tower. In the original radio episode, Sigun kills Gauguin when he points out how much the value of his paintings will increase once he is dead. I'm but a poor old painter, so I see by your poor old painting. You insult me, we must fight a duel! <laughs> In the terrible revenge of Fred Fu Manchu, due to a potion he is tricked into drinking, Bloodnock can blow up, i.e. kill, whoever he points his finger at. This was changed in the TV adaptation, as a blast from Bloodnock and Fred's fingers only caused the victim's trousers to fall down. How many of you got to come back to before it explodes? Um... <laughs> I don't know. Well, you better let it and count how long it takes, then you'll know, won't you? These last two changes may appear to make the series a bit more appropriate for children to view, but many episodes still ended with characters drowning or being blown up. The Telegoons wasn't intentionally tailored to be a children's program, but as is inevitable with all things animated, be they puppets or drawings, the series' main viewers were aged between 5 and 15. Over lightning shots! Be careful how you say that! <laughs> The Goon Show was full of double meanings, but it certainly wasn't obscene in any way, especially when compared to other future programs that broke the mould. Neither the critics nor goons were thrilled by the end result of the puppet show, and Milligan refused all other offers to adapt the series. However, he, Sellers, and Seacombe were filmed performing, i.e. reading, Goon Show scripts in 1966, 68, and 72. The televised Tales of Men shirts featured John Cleese as the narrator, who at the time was well on his way to becoming a bigger name than his three idols, having appeared in The Frost Report with the two Ronnies, and the radio series I'm Sorry I'll Read That Again with the goodies. The Telegoons has never been given an official DVD release, or even a VHS one, but there were other forms of merchandising produced back in the mid-60s. There was a Telegoons comic strip, hand puppets and dolls of Eccles, and its theme tune was released via several TV Themes of the Day records. However, like a lot of unreleased TV shows, it was given an unofficial DVD release. In 2006, EarthStation1.com put all 26 episodes onto four DVDs. The discs contain no menus, and more importantly, the episodes themselves are unsurprisingly not restored, but are far from unwatchable. Tony Young died from a cancer-related illness in 1966. Who knows what other things he might have achieved had he lived longer? Perhaps a puppet version of Round the Horn? For a much more in-depth insight into the history of the Telegoon's production, check out its website. You've been specially selected for a specially dangerous mission. Does this mean I've been specially selected for a specially dangerous mission? So you've guessed, eh? A moment while I remove this heavy disguise. 
You're to make your way to Hungary via Budapest. Does that mean I'll have to go abroad? If all else fails, yes. Thank you for watching Obscure Observations. Next time, I'll show you how to cure your gorilla smoking habits by simply going ow and counting your needle noodle news. <coughs> 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 <coughs>